thanks for coming. Um, ask it questions at any time. And uh, I'm just going to, um, I don't have anything too sexy to paint today, but I have some interesting things nonetheless. So um, what I have here is I have an Iwata airbrush. The advantage of having the airbrush, you can take your modeling to the next level. There's things you can do with the airbrush you simply can't do with a paintbrush. So there's different types. You've got to take a look at what you're looking at with, uh, with your airbrush. Now, this one is what's called a double action. And I don't know if you're familiar, I'm just trying to talk to everybody. In this one, I push down, I get air, and I pull back, and I get color. So what this one does is it allows me to mute color and play with color without ever taking my finger off the trigger. A lot of airbrushes, you know, if you're using what's called a single action, you can set your spray with your nozzle and then spray. Then if you want to adjust the spray, you must do it again. With this, I can simply just play with, I can just simply play with the color in the air, all with one push of the button. Okay, so that's the advantage of the double action airbrush. Some people are happy with single action. I've always used a double action. And in fact, now there's one out. I believe it's almost a triple action. This is called a gravity feed. So the paint, um, I like the gravity feed because to me there's less things that can go wrong with a gravity feed. Um, the paint goes in there and with the solvent and it simply comes down by gravity. On a, um, on a suction feed, the cup, you can have these where the cup is almost underneath. And I don't know if one of these ones, kind of like this affair here with the bottle underneath. And by suction, it's drawn, yeah, it's drawn up. Yep, it's drawn up that way. There's different makes of airbrushes. Uh, we've got Pash over there. Badger, I use Badger for years. It's a very good make. Um, probably a couple of years ago, I converted to Iwata. I don't know why, but I used a Badger since, probably used a Badger for 25, 30 years. Um, won a lot of big awards with my models using Badger airbrushes. So, you know, it's all your personal preference. And to me, the only thing that I would, the only thing that I would, um, and I mean, everybody goes online to do this stuff, but to buy, Getting replacement parts for your airbrush is a convenience, and in town you can do that for some makes, and for some you can't. So I mean, if you're an internet shopper, you can go on and get any part. What happens here, you can see when I pull it back, watch this thing in here move. See that moves, that's pulling the needle back. And that's introducing color to the, to the nozzle, okay? This airbrush is a little more robust. I'm gonna be honest with you, don't be, um, don't be misled by my uh, care and, and doting over the airbrush. I'm kind of known in the modeling circles for not cleaning it, um, doing the minimum, but still getting good results out of it. There's actually one school of thought that says you should never clean it. Once you clean it, you're gonna you know, do things. I don't believe that. I, I take it apart now and then and just get whatever's in there out of it, okay? But normally um, they're pretty good. There's different sources of air. We've talked about the brush, let's talk about your source of air. You can get a compressor. Some people use a tire, inflate a tire, and put a, run a line off it. Um, you know, the can, the bottled air is, you know, is good, but the reality is it's a bottle full of air. And at the end of the day, um, it can be very expensive for you to keep buying these because they run out and there's no use for them after that, right? It's not that you can refill them. So, I mean, it, it's good, at when I first started, I had I had this, okay? I think everybody had this. At one point, you come home, you're excited, you buy the airbrush, you bring it home, you want to use it, what are you going to do? You can't blow into the hose, you can maybe use this. So it all depends on what your, um, what, what your budget is. And I, you know, depending on the airbrush, this airbrush here is probably worth about 250 bucks. It's, it's a high, higher end one. You can spend, I know one guy in Toronto, a model, he spent 900 for an airbrush. I would never spend $900 for an airbrush. Because I, I mean, if I dropped it, I would feel terrible, right? Um, which is, I don't have my holder here, so I'm likely to drop it. This one you can see is, is the same. It's an Iwata, double action. But you can see just by its frame that it's a little bit smaller than this one. So this is more of a high detailed for me. This is a luxury for me to buy one like this. Um, but I can do fine detail. This alien that I painted here, I airbrushed that alien. That was fun. I just sat back and 
um, and I'll talk to you about some of the concepts of airbrushing and introduce you. I, again, I can answer any questions. I can keep this as technical as you like or as basic as you like. No, whatever, whatever you guys like. So, you no, know, if you feel that I know all that, then ask me something else, and I'll see what I can what I can do for you. So, um, what I'm going to do is when you paint, um, you should probably prime. Now, this is not going to be a modeling seminar, but I can answer any questions on seam filling, um, anything you want, okay? I use a lot of supplies that are here. I use supplies that are outside of here, right? Um, are you, like, this is uh, Mr. Color, Krios. It's a Japanese company. They make, I like their primer. To me, it makes a primer. It's just this is what I've always used. I know a lot of guys that use to me a primer. I'm gonna start off by priming. So I've got some things I can prime here. And you prime before, before painting. So I bought some flaps from my, uh, my Phantom Jet Fighter. I've got some airlines and flaps. Now, you know, holding on to these things, there's different techniques. Some people get really crazy with it. Um, here's simply what I do. I go to the art store and I get one of these old things like this. I just tape stuff on it. Then I can, uh, you can't spray everything in one go. So you can get a little creative here with how you want to, uh, how you want to get these things presented to paint them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just prime, do some priming. What I'm going to do in a, in later is I'll show you guys, you guys have a little bit of a treat here today and I'll show you what I'm going to do. Um, I dug this old chestnut out I haven't worked on in a while. Who knows what kind of a plane that is? Sky Raider. Right now I've taken the Tamiya kit, knocked it back, I backdated it to a Korean War um, plane. Now, on the outset, this is just an all blue, dark blue plane that dies on the table. Okay, you look at it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it some pop. I'm going to show you what I can do with this airbrush to make this more three-dimensional than it is. Your basic, and when you're doing this, your basic rules are top lighting. Just imagine the light hitting it on top and should get lighter and then darker and I can achieve these effects with the airbrush so I will paint that um, I'll, I'll put some paint on that so I brought my little to me a magic stir stick now there's no everybody gets scientific here but I don't I break a few rules one they say you should never mix paint in the color cup I mix paint in the color cup all the time so um, I screwed that on tight so it doesn't spill. So what I'll do is I'll, I always put thinner in the cup first and, and you'll see what I'll do here in a minute. Right now I can just spray it. So I'm just spraying thinner out of it right now. I'm spraying right now at about about 30, maybe more than that PSI. I'm going to knock it back a bit. And I'll knock it down to maybe about 20 PSI. No, it's dropping down lower than that. Hang on. Yeah, it's really not. It's not bad. Yeah. If you have an open door, that's fine. I, I have a spray booth at home. I wear a mask. But I put it this way. How many times you walk through the mall, those nail places, and they're all in there spraying, and I mean, they're yes. gagging on fumes, and nobody yeah. seems to worry about that. You know, health and modeling, I can answer some questions on that. I mean, I got to be honest with you, I've been doing this for a while. I mean, and uh, I mean, you take precautions, but at the end of the day, you're probably breathing in more carbon monoxide when you go outside from yeah. the cars than you are with, with this. This is not like industrial spraying, this is just... So there I can... You can see the gray primer coming out. I've got that a bit thin right now. It's a bit runny. You want an almost the consistency of milk. Okay. Now you can see when I push down, I'm getting air, but nothing's coming out. I pull back. And now I'm getting my, I'm getting my color. Now this is a primer. Okay. It's like doing a real automobile or a piece of machinery. You prime it, and this is a sandable primer. So you'll see that I can actually prime 
and then I can sand after to make sure that I get a smooth finish on what I'm doing. So I'm just going to put this on here right now. Rules of thumb, which is actually not a good expression to use, but everybody seems to use it. Yeah. Um, never stop moving the airbrush once you are painting because you stop moving it. See when I keep moving it, I get a nice mist. And then when I stop moving it, what do I get? So never stop moving the airbrush. It should be kind of like in the Karate Kid, wax on, wax off. You should turn it on and keep it on as you make passes. Now I can take liberties, I gotta be honest with you, I've been at it for a while, so you can see right now I've got it moving. And if you go in, if you come in, you'll see that I'm priming this um, right now. And you'll come, I'll hold it up and you can see it. So that's wet right now, but you can see how nice it's all primed. Nice and smooth yeah, yes. on the nice. end. Okay? So how long does that take uh, that primer takes uh, to dry? I could sand this in minutes. I could probably sand it by the time you and I finish talking. It's fast. Yeah. And what I do is I blow air on it. That's the beauty of the double action airbrush. I blow air on it to uh, dry. if you really want to get it to dry quickly, use a hair dryer. Blow dryer, which clearly I don't have, but um, <laughs> um, my wife has one so um, you can yeah you can use it well you know grass doesn't grow on a busy street right so um, so you can use a blow a blow dryer will really accent um, and accelerate your your paint drying time but you'll see in a minute like this is drying the the glistening is coming off it right now it's gonna dry very quickly okay so what I'm doing is I'm gonna maybe I'm kind of rushing this piece a bit. This is for a jet that I'm building at home. But I may paint this white today depending on uh, how happy I am with what I got going here. And uh, we can maybe uh, maybe show you some white. So white's a hard color to paint with. Uh, red is, in modeling terms, the hardest color to paint with. So a trick when painting red is paint it white first and then paint it red. And it will give it pop. Or paint it silver and then paint it red. Same with yellow. If you're painting anything yellow, like when I painted that thing that this grill is standing on, whatever it's, uh, painted it white or silver, and then I actually used the salt technique. Has anybody heard the salt about the salt technique for modeling? Yeah. What you do is you take table salt, and I painted that silver, and if you look at it in detail, I painted it silver, and then I dropped salt on it with a bit of water, table salt. And then I let it set, and then I paint it yellow, and then I knock the salt off and it's got realistic paint chipping and you can see the silver showing through and you can create I did it on this tank too um, that's a that's a, a desert storm tank that um, I use various techniques on again but anyways this is looking pretty good so I'm just gonna blow dry it for a minute I just don't want to set it down um, I've just used this primer since the 80s these guys were the first ones to make primer and I just never switched off it right mm -hmm. but like I say to me a primer is out of the can mm -hmm. lots of my friend just uses it yesterday bought a can yesterday and used it it all depends what your preference is right I mean um, I find I like to do things for the airbrush because I have better control yeah, well, as, as to spray, spray bomb but if I was doing a big something big I, I would buy a can of that to me of stuff and just spray it out of the spray can mm -hmm. like if I was doing say I was gonna prime this I would buy just buy a spray bomb and just do it rather than sit here like this right so it all depends on what you're doing and how you're trying to achieve it right and what's your paint now this is mr. color paint here this is a lacquer paint but to me it's just introduced their line of lacquers I don't know if anybody's tried them but they're excellent they're silver um, I've used that silver it's outstanding um, it's great stuff so I've used some of that paint I just use whatever that's to me a paint on there but that's mr. color paint which is this stuff let, let me caution you and yeah. cheap cheapening, cheapening out on your it. paint you spend many months painting a model and then save a buck on your thinner uh, you might have heartbreak I would 
I would stick to systems that you know. Yeah. Okay? Like I, I stick to the Mr. Sis, to Mr. The, the Tamiya system um, if I use Tamiya Paint. Let's prime some more. I think this thing's getting dry. But you can see how smooth it is, mm -hmm. right? It just creates a nice smooth finish. So, you know, the thing is, guys, don't try to hide a bad paint job with more paint. It doesn't work. No. Here we go. You can see it again. I just test spray it before I spray it. Then I'm just giving it And what the primer does is it shows me if there's any scratches or flaws and then I can buff them out. So when I put my final, final paint finish on, it's as flawless as I can, as I can get it, okay? Now you may notice um, my, the shirt I have on, we have a really good model club in town if anybody's interested. We meet once a month, um, always happy to entertain new members. It's a great source of information and camaraderie in this hobby, which is kind of a solitary hobby. Um, going, you know, different demonstrations are done at the model club. I just did an airbrushing demonstration at our model club a couple of months ago. Um, where I painted an F-14 Tomcat fighter. So, Again, these flaps, I'm just going to wait for the primer to kind of dry on them. And uh, you can see that. That's a lot better than brush. Oh, yeah, you know what? I never, I'm going to tell you guys something. I don't brush paint anything. The only thing I would ever brush paint would be the cockpit where I'm doing knobs and stuff. I would never brush paint like a small detail where I need a couple of strokes because it's just. It leaves brush marks. This is the reality of it, yeah. right? Now, some people say if you brush paint it and put it in the oven at the right temperature, you can settle it down. But I'm not. I'm not prepared. I'm not prepared to do that. I don't know what temperature it's at, but you don't want it. You know, bake an apple pie while you're uh, curing the model, right? Okay. So there's some primer. A couple of other useful modeling tools: cloth sandpapers, which I use big time. I use these things. So what I can do when I paint something is this is a 4,000 grit. I've got up to 12,000 grit. So these, this is not regular sandpaper. If you have any questions about sanding, if you get a flaw in your paint, you can buff it out, okay? So this stuff here is 4,000. So if I prime and I see something I don't like, I can buff it out with these fine grade sandpapers to a nice smooth finish. And then I can, before I put my final coat of paint on. Okay? So that's, you know, that's the way it, uh, the way it kind of works. Um, you hold an airbrush kind of like a pen. There's different styles. But, you know, you'll see how I hold it. I hold it, you know, with my finger under there, my trigger finger there. So I can just kind of move it around pretty, pretty easily. Just use up my cup here. No need to waste. Uh, pouring paint that you thinned back in the original container, not the best idea because you eventually contaminate it, thin it too much. You're best just to spray it to exhaustion or just wipe it out, okay? I used to do that and then I found that sometimes the paint would start to get really crappy near the end, so. But this stuff, as I said, it all depends on your system. If you wanna try Mr. Color, um, I like it, right? I would love for them to get it here. I don't know if they will or they won't. Um, because then it's just another option. Because I really don't use anything other than Tamiya right, right here. So if I need Tamiya, I just come here and buy Tamiya. Or if I need Mr. Color, I just go in and get that. Some people swear by Pash, love Pash. You know, and uh, Badger, as I said, had a Badger for uh, for years. Um, just went to Iwata recently. Um, heard some good things about Iwata. Thought I'd try a change. And, uh, you know, replacement parts, as I said, is, um, is an important aspect to airbrushes, right? You've got it at some point. Like if I was to drop this on the ground, I would be very quickly getting a new tip. 
for probably 50 bucks, right? This, you, won't, you can't even see it. That little tip right there, little brass tip, is 55 bucks. And how do I know? Because I replaced one. Because <laughs> I was doing... I had one fall on the floor into the modeling abyss when I was doing some stuff. So, what will I do now? I will take this airplane and I will start to paint it. As you can see, this is a gloss dark sea blue airplane. Not a lot to it, but you can make a lot to it by introducing a little bit of color. So, um, some modelers like to work in the world of scale color. I don't really do that. In other words, if you look at a scale, this is a 48 scale airplane. You're looking at it uh, one inch basically um, on this, 48 inches on the real thing. So having said that, some believe that I'm really looking at this thing farther away than it really is even though it's in front of me. I, I, my area of expertise would be um, probably US naval aircraft. Right now I'm on a big Vietnam kick. Um, I've met I met, a, I met a couple of MiG killers um, that flew in that war recently and uh, this one is Korean War it's all blue but once these planes get outside salt air they weather and so what you can do is you can introduce different ways of presenting the color and I'll show you what I mean by that so I start off with my thinner and uh, start off with some thinner right there now I'm going to do this really light because when you're airbrushing um, the technique I use and the philosophy that I use is layers. I paint in layers. Better to paint four light coats than one heavy coat. Okay? Because you put on a heavy coat and you could get what we call orange peel. You have to blend the right amount of air and paint to get a nice... Now you can see on that if you were to touch it, you can feel it, how smooth it is, yeah. right? And so what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, drop a bit of white in here. Now there's all kinds um, of techniques you can use. Who knows what pre-shading is? Who know, who's seen that technique, pre-shading? That's where you take, and it, it works particularly well on white aircraft, where you take, you paint it white, and then you go over it with um, black paint over the panel lines and then you shade it then you go back over it with the original color and then you create depth that way it's like shadowing yeah it's yeah. pre-shading yeah. I like to do that plus I like to use a little bit of almost rendering where I actually blend in the colors with the airbrush and I'll show you this here is gloss dark sea blue this is the color of most naval aircraft in the end of World War II. Can you hold that for me, please? I just, I just, I just don't want to create a mess here. Thanks. Don't have my stand, so. So what I'm going to do, thank you, is I'm going to mix a little bit. Now you can see I've got white in here, right? So what I can do is I told you that the light is hitting this thing from the top. So I can go along the top of this aircraft with light blue. And like I said, it's not going to jump out at you, it's subtle. But you can see, if you come in and look at it, it's lightening up. I can even lighten it up more if I want. See, I'm lightening at the top. I will spray some light blue on it. See? See? So I'm doing it fine. I'm doing it in layers. So I am just introducing some light blue on top. Now, when you paint airplanes or vehicles or anything, there's a simple formula. Back and down. Do not weather an airplane from the back forward because they don't fly backwards. Okay, I've seen some models that shows that are terrible because they weather them from the back, right? 
this plane is not this plane moves in this direction so things chipping is going to be mostly on the leading edges and it's going to fly that direction now you watch what I'm doing here guys I'm just having fun with it right right now look at this I've got very little coming out of it see very little coming out of it and you can see when you look at the wing aircraft panels there's a whole science on panels on aircraft aircraft panels weather from the inside out so the outside should be darker and if you want to give it natural depth you do the middle of the panel light so if I do the middle of that panel light and then I go back with a heavier coat you'll see what I mean in a minute and I will do that so I can do it I can do it in the middle you know you can do it whatever whatever you like right so I have it but like I said you can see it if you see the light playing off it you can see that it's getting highlighted okay it's subtle so there's really nothing you can't, I mean, I'm, I'm always asked by my friends, I would say that a strength I have in this hobby is I know how to fix things, right? If I was to drop, say I'm fooling around, I drop that X-Acto blade into the knife, into the, into the edge, and I gouge the paint out, people are going, oh my gosh, the end of the world. Not a big deal, I just get this, put it in the airbrush, I buff it, then I prime it, I buff it again and then I remove the the mark. Easy, right? I'll show you how fast it dries. I'm going to buff this right now. I'm going to buff out those little clear marks. So you see any little marks is buff them out. So you don't have to be you can see how fast that paint dries, right? Like I'm 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 basically sanding it. And you just saw me put it on. That's the advantage of lacquers, right? Quick drying. Quick drying. And they're tough. You can mask on them, not pull it off. It's good stuff. But if you guys are interested in joining the London Model Club, we have a big show every year too. Just uh, I think there's information right here. So actually the president of the club is standing over there. <laughs> because he's a shy president. But you see guys, I could play with this. I would sit here for hours doing this. Just you can see like I'm not sitting here in a plume of overspray because I've got my pressure down pretty good. I mean, if I was at home I'd wear a mask. Yeah. Right? And I, and I have my booth on. I mean? what for sure are you spraying right now I'm spraying at about 20 psi now if I not careful mixing the paint and it makes it a little thicker I can jack it yeah like I I can blow, I can blow mud out of here really I can just put the pressure up to like 50 60 70 psi and just blow blow it out of here right so in your opinion is it better to airbrush a completed model or would you do like the pieces first I do pieces first where I can. Yeah. See, right now, you want to put as much of it together as you can. Yep. But these things, I simply, like that, I don't want to paint that when it's on the model because it's, I'm, you know, it's tough yep. right, to do that. So I want to paint it like these stabilators here. I wouldn't paint those on the model. Like you want, you'll see, this is normally where I get the model to the state where I can't. I don't even have the cowling on it, right? But that right now, that's a completed model, so I can I can weather it, and I can basically stress it. I can make it look old, because in in combat, I mean, some people, but it's all personal preference. Some people in the model world detest weathered models. So you can see, that's what you do um, when you want to uh, just weather. Now I'll come back and I'll show you what I can do with this in a minute. I'll just do a little bit here. I don't do the whole thing unless you You know, this is not always a spectator sport, but it's sometimes necessary to see what what techniques are done. So, so what about with um, camouflage? So yep. do you find, like, because I have a lot of people that 
who come in here, but I don't know what, how, what to recommend for doing a camouflage finish, right? Yep. Especially, I'm assuming that it's way easier to do it with an airbrush than it would be with spray bottle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you get a little bit more, more fine, polished look. And you can feather, you can feather one color into another with the camouflage, right? Again, that's a whole other, that's a very good topic. Yeah. Um, I can answer any questions on that, although I'm not, I'm just doing single color stuff today. But to do camouflage, I'll tell you a really good way to prevent overspray is to go to the art store. I don't know if you sell it here. Blue Tack, have you heard of that? What is that? Blue Tack. It's what they use in the art stores. It's just like plaster scene. You can stick. Oh, so like the sticky tack stuff. Like sticky like tack. Very good. So if I wanted to do a camouflage, I got a big ball of that stuff at home. then you're halfway there. So if I wanted to do like a camouflage thing along this wing, uh -huh. I could just get the blue tack and then I could just run it in place. And then I could spray and then I would get a soft edge without getting over onto the other color. So it's not, it's not hard, like a hard if you just did it with masking tape, it would look yeah, like a hard yeah, line. Hard line. Mm. So you can use blue tack. Blue tack is really easy to use. Like you just put it on. And then if you get it, spray it right, it'll give you a soft edge without running into the other, the other color. So that's one thing you can, you can use for camouflage. Okay. So, um, yeah, no problem. But what I do do, I mean, with the airbrush, the first step is being comfortable with your airbrush and knowing I'm just going to buff this out. It's being comfortable with your airbrush. The next step, like I said with me, is and a lot of the modelers is is taking it beyond just a single color and, and using different shades to give it pop like this tank you can see this tank is a sand color but when you look at it you'll see a lot of different tones in it right tones that are achieved by um, airbrushing and oil paint washes I've got these sanding pads that I bought here to me as sanding pads which I use they're I don't even know what it is. I just cut up a piece and throw it in the box and then buff with it. But, you know, um, Tamiya is good. Tamiya, you'll never go wrong buying a Tamiya kit. You'll never go wrong buying Tamiya accessories. Like there's, I don't think I've ever bought anything and they said, what a bunch of crap. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, um, they're, they're a good modeling company. Tamiya, Tamiya is probably, in my opinion, all things considered, the best in the world. For armor, cars, airplanes. In my opinion, you can any of those Tamiya kits. You can never, you can never go wrong with them. So you can see right now, I'm just lightening it up. See, if you look at that wing now, see it's pretty light, right? It's in, see how it's, yeah. see all the the, high, the the light parts. So now I would go normally over this whole tank or over this whole airplane rather, but I'm not going to do that today. Um, I'll just airbrush as long as people are interested in uh, watching or asking questions. So again, you can see there, if you look at that plane, you can see that there is some light, right? I've given it some. Now when I go back, which I'll do in a moment, with the original color, you'll see what, how it becomes a little bit more pronounced, okay? So this paint here, like I say, is Mr. Color. This is um, a gloss. So when I go back on this, if I follow the panel lines, you'll see what's going to happen here. Um, so you can see when I go back on the leading edge, you can see the darker colors, and I'll, I'll give you a better example of it in a minute. Now again, I would have to play with this a little more, but I just want to give you guys some results today. See when I go back now, see the leading edge, how it becomes more interesting, right? It becomes more interesting. Um, now what I'll do to tie it all in, is I'll give it, after I do that, I'll give it one big coat. You can see I've gone light and dark, and now when I spray one coat over it, it blends it. 
doesn't make it, it blends it together and gives it some continuity. And that's the way you do it. It's just simple. You just play with, you take your basic color of paint, you paint the model that color. Then you go back. If you want to make it look interesting, because your Gundams, you can get some outstanding results on those. Um, then you go back, you lighten the paint, and then you just give it some pop, some interest areas, right? If you want to make it chipped, um, paint the Gundam, for example, silver, then put some salt on it. Or who's heard of the hairspray technique? That's another one. That's another big one. If you buy Trazome hairspray from the store and you paint the gun, say you paint the Gundam silver, then you put hairspray on it. You, you can just spray it on. And then when you put paint on it, you have to use, I think probably a water-based paint works better. Paint the model. And then it looks all green, for example. Then you take some water with a brush and you go at the paint and because of the hairspray, the paint will lift and you get really interesting chipping. You can, again guys, you can see it online. If you go for the hairspray technique online, you'll see it done. But I'm saying for things like Gundams and Star Wars, and you want to get really interesting chipping, and I use it, we use it in military too. You can get some really interesting chipping effects um, on your paint, on your paint finishes. So it makes it look like, you know, the paint's lifted, flaked. Um, you can do it with rust. You could paint it rust color underneath, then paint it green, and then chip it, and then you get rust showing through. So, I mean, those are just ways to take the model to the next level of realism, right? That's what, what you're trying to do. Now, another technique you can use that really is interesting for weathering, you just take a piece of tape, and then you go along the panel line. If I want to create more starkness, I go along the panel line, say right here, Make sure I get this down. I, I do everything under a magnifier, right? Then I know I'm exact. But for example, okay, I've got tape there. Remember I said airplane weathers from front to back? So I can go on here now. And I'll pull this out. And then I'll just paint it like that. Pull away the tape. And then I get, you can't, you can't, you got to see it in the light. You can see the weathering effect right around the flap, the airline, right? Flap would be there, airline there. But you see how it looks interesting? See, that's how you do it. If I want to give that height, again, I want to give these panels some height. I just do a bit of uh, dark in there, leave it light in the middle. You can see that there, go over it, gives it some, gives it some interest, gives it some pop. Now you guys might think, well, you know, I'd like to go, I'd like to do it heavier, but you can look at that wing now, and I'll be honest with you guys, it still needs more work, but look at how more interesting it looks when you look at it. It's subtle though, right? Yeah. If back where this gentleman's standing there, I mean, he's probably just seeing dark blue depending on how he's looking at it but when you move in you'll see that it, it takes more interest right uh, who knows about dry brushing technique you guys familiar with that uh, yeah yeah just put yeah just put the paint on the brush make sure you dry it out and just whisk it I did it along there we've got ribs it's really good effective where you got ribs or rivets things like that so you can uh, you can achieve that effect with that Okay, but it's all done with you, you got to play with the pressure really the finer you want the line The thinner you should make the paint because you can't be blowing thick paint out only at a high pressure yeah. And when you're working close with a high pressure like this, that's what you'll get Right you want to make sure that you're introducing very little air When you're in tight like that see I can even get it tighter than that. There we go So you can really bring it in, depending on how you wanna, you wanna do it. All you're doing, guys, is detail, detail painting, with yeah. the airbrush, right? Um, is detail painting with it. So, um, again, you can see with this, I can, uh, 
Now another trick I can I can show you, but I won't. I don't know if I, I can do it. If I cut the paint really back and added lots of thinner and put it on, I'd get a gloss finish that you could you could see a reflection out of easily, almost like this guy. You can almost see you can see your finger when you put him on it. That's all done with really thin paint at high pressure, and uh, that's just again that's a technique for another day, but. Yeah. So if I wanted to put like a high gloss finish here, I can show you now. I'll do it, but then we'll just uh, put this guy away. Okay, right now if I just jack the thinner in here, watch what happens. Now this paint, you're going to go Larry, are you even painting? Like, oh yeah, there's a bit of paint in there, but not much. So right now, see watch, there's nothing when you paint it. You don't really see much, see? But watch this, when I go here, Hey, look at how glossy that is now, see? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's just done. See how glossy that is? You can see it. That's just all done by adding more. This is a gloss paint, but I just added more thinner to it. And it gives it pop. See now, um, yeah, but you can see how glossy that is compared to what I painted over there, right? So I can muzzle well. Just like that, see? So, I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do with these things. Yeah, you can see it. See it shining, guys, in the light? Yeah. But that's a good question by, uh, by the gentleman. Um, if you're going to decal, you want to put a gloss coat down. Mm -hmm. And to me, it makes gloss coats. And what you do, it's just a clear coat. And so you spray it on. You cannot decal on a flat painted surface because flat paint the reason it's flat is because the light's not reflecting off it it's being absorbed and it's kind of bumpy the camouflage paint is kind of like that's a flat finish there and you can see it's non-reflective right I couldn't decal over that when I decaled I had to gloss the areas I was going to decal put the decal down and then I put flat coat on it to bring it back down so you're exactly right could I decal on that I bet I could but um, I would probably apply some flat coat just to be sure or clear coat just to be sure you see how clear that is guys How shiny that is It's really like uh, nice. You got me turned on by this. I want to do more right? <laughs> see, It's like uh, this is an addiction It's a good addiction keeps you home at night yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, Probably cheap probably more expensive than some other addictions but, yeah. um, 